Yeah, first, Eric has asked us to talk a little bit about Canada Thistle, and I tend to talk a little quietly, so if you, if you all can't hear me, feel free to tell me to speak up, so. Yeah, Canada, Canada okay, <laughs> yeah, thanks Liz. So yeah, Canada Thistle is our topic um, for the day. So Canada Thistle is one of about 70 plant species that back in the early 1990s, our state leg legislature designated as a noxious weed. And so um, with that designation came the requirement from the state and then by, by extension from the county to manage this plant in order to protect the ecological and economic resources that I'm listing up on the screen there. So, so, but the state also went a step further and they said, in addition to that requirement to manage Canada thistle, it's also important that we manage it in a way that's uh, site specific and appropriate to the land use goals of a particular site and the surrounding ecosystem. So that's a lot of what Jim and I will talk about today is, is how, uh, you, you know, in managing Canada thistle, where we're managing it really matters in how we manage it. So um, I, I put uh, down at the bottom of the, of, this, of the slide there, you'll see that website address. That is uh, the address to the Colorado Department of Agriculture Noxious Weed Site. And if you're interested in learning more about the noxious weed law and the plants that fall, fall underneath that, that's a great website to visit. Lots of information there. I was really glad that Eric um, asked us to talk about Canada, Canada thistle specifically. There, there are a bunch of noxious weeds around that we could have talked about. But this one seems especially appropriate for a group of rural landowners for a number of reasons. So <clears throat> first of all, Canada thistle, I, I think is the, I feel comfortable saying that it's the most prevalent noxious weed in Gunnison County. We estimate that there are about 300 acres infested with Canada thistle basin wide. Um, and I suspect that that's a pretty conservative estimate. I, I, bet, th I bet there's actually more than that. It's a good plant for us to talk about because due to the growing conditions that Canada thistle really favors, you know, it, it grows in moist soils, with a little bit of moisture, it likes deeper soils, it likes soils with a little bit of organic matter in them. And so as a consequence, we see Canada thistle mostly growing in and near the valley bottoms. And, and that, that of course is where most of the private land in the valley is and probably where many of us uh, you know, live and work. So I bet this is a plant that a lot of us come across in the in our daily lives and in, in our our where we where we work, live, and play. So it's a good plant that probably um, affects most of us. So I'm glad we're talking about that. One of the things our office does at the Gunnison County Weed Management Program is to assist private landowners with advice and consultation um, and also assistance to eradicate and, and control Canada thistle on private properties. And so we get a lot of calls about this plant. In midsummer, it's, it's probably the call that comes in most frequently is how do I manage Canada thistle? You know, because I, I think a lot of landowners just sort of deal with it and struggle with it. There's always a subset of those phone calls where people are asking about thistle in general. How do I control thistle, you know? And when we get that question, we feel like it's really important to, to dig a little deeper and find out which thistle the landowner is trying to manage. Because in addition to Canada thistle, we do have four other species of thistles that show up on that state noxious weed list. So there's musk thistle, plumeless thistle, bull thistle and scotch thistle that also grow in Gunnison County. Those are all biennial thistles. So they have a different life cycle, a different growth pattern. And as a consequence, we manage them differently and time the management differently than we do on Canada thistle. So you can see it's kind of important to know which thistle you're dealing with as you approach management. And just to, to muddy the waters a little bit further, Jim and I felt like it was also really important to mention that in Gunnison County, we do have uh, a, about a dozen or so species of native thistles. And here are a few, few common ones that you may see around. These I think are really important components of the plant community and of the ecosystem. We see native thistles being utilized by all kinds of different pollinators from birds, 
butterflies, moths, several species of native bees, beetles, ants, and so on. So I think that, that native thistles really play kind of an important role in our native plant community and, and also the ecosystem as a whole. And I mention this along with those other biennial thistles just to stress the importance of accurate plant identification as a first step in weed management, right? So we want to make sure that, you know, what we're managing is what we think it is, that we're managing the things that need to be managed, and ideally letting the things that don't need to be managed be. So, um, let's see, so for, you know, for those of you, I, I bet most of you can identify Canada thistle from a mile away, but for those of you who, who may not be as familiar with it, I thought I'd throw this slide up just to sh show what that plant looks like at different times of the year. So as it emerges in the spring, you'll see the rosettes, like, like the ones there on the, on the left emerge from the ground. As the temperature heats up later into the late spring and early summer, that plant will bolt and begin to flower. And then as we go into late summer and early fall, it sets seed and, and starts to look like that slide that's on your right there. So, and then given enough time, you may up with, end up with something like this, a big old colony, you know? And, and by, the time, by the time Canada thistle gets to this point, it starts to get a little intimidating, you know? It's kind of mean looking. And a lot of times those are the calls we get, you know, people are kind of intimidated and don't know how to deal with something like that. And it's another reason Jim and I felt like it, Canada thistle is a great plant to talk about at this, at this event because as mean and intimidating as that looks, Jim and I find that if you can implement the right control methods, time them correctly, and be persistent about it over the course of three or four or five, six years, depending on severity of infestation, this is a plant that you can manage. It, it really comes under control fairly easily. And it's something that, um, you know, if you do it right, you can really be successful with it. So that's another reason we were excited to talk about Canada thistle today. So I want to talk for just a minute about the biology of, this, of Canada thistle and how that might affect how we go about managing it. So when it gets to this point, you know, late summer, the plant's full of seeds it's easy to get real panicky about it because, you know, you think, oh boy, the next windy day that comes along, those seeds are going to blow everywhere, you know, and I'm going to have a million plants on my property next, next year, and it's easy just to sort of give up. But the good news about Canada thistle is that seed viability is, is really very low. Somewhere in the ballpark of 5 to 10 percent of Canada thistle seed is viable or has the ability to germinate. And then of that 5%, you know, I, I mentioned that Canada thistle has a somewhat narrow range of places where it likes to grow. So of that 5 to 10%, only a, only a certain percentage of those seeds will land in a spot where they can germinate and establish. So, um, you know, that being said, each Canada thistle plant can produce up to about 5,000 seeds on average if it's healthy. So even if one or two percent of those plants finds a good or seeds finds a good place to germinate it's still a fairly significant number of new plants that that can can germinate and, and establish new colonies but i did want to mention that that seed viability aspect because a lot of people feel like oh they just failed if their plant goes to seed but really a lot of times it's not as bad as it looks you know so where canada thistle is concerned from a control standpoint it's really the vegetative growth and reproduction that we're concerned about as opposed to uh, reproduction by seed. So Canada thistle is a creeping perennial with a rhizomatous or like a net-like root system. And let me show you a picture of what it looks like underground. That slide on the right is where they've excavated down into the root system. And that root system can really run ver both vertically, uh, uh, vertically and horizontally as much as 15 feet or so. So you can imagine by the time a plant gets to that size, it's got a lot of stored energy in its root system. And the plant's response when we go to control that top growth, regardless how we do it, whether it's by chemical means or if we mow it or pull it, 
the plant's response is going to be to send up energy from the root system and form a new flush of top growth. And so to put it very simply, our goal in controlling Canada thistle over time is really to diminish the stored energy reserves in the roots more quickly than that plant can make new energy from the sun. So we're just trying to exhaust that plant over time. And that's why persistence is, is such a key aspect of control. The, the complex part arises in deciding how to best go about um, exhausting that root system given the conditions on the site, the land management goals, and the surrounding environment. And I know of nobody who's more experienced in dealing with those various situations than this guy right here, Jim. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jim, to talk about methods of control. Thanks, John. Can you switch it over to oh, mine yeah. for me? Run that for me? Yeah. This is a new experience for me. I've not ever done this one. But, um, today we're going to talk about Canada thistle control in turf and small pack pastures. And if we have time, we'll go into some flower bed stuff. But the first thing, we've got some things that are common to all of them. And the 10-foot rule is the old standard to spray the weed in 10 feet out from the weed. What we see a lot of is, is the donut effect. People will get the center of it, but there's weeds on the outside. There's two things that happen. One is you'll miss the little tiny seedlings that are outside of where the very uh, big plants are. And the second thing is, is that if you're using a chemical that can treat, go into the ground and get the roots, as John said, those roots extend far beyond that big plant that you're looking at. We won't go full 10 feet, a lot of cases, but we will three feet, three feet behind where you see where the plants are. The next one, persistence is better than prescription. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people think is that us commercial operators have access to chemicals that the private individual does not. That's not usually the case. There are a lot of over-the-counter chemicals that are just as effective, but persistence, again, stay with it. John talked about several years to get control, and control is, is, a, is what it is. We're not talking about elimination of Canada thistle in Gunnison Valley. Uh, spray the entire plant. I have a lot of people on small properties that will use it like a gun and they'll go out and shoot it right in the center of the plant, I guess trying to be kind to the plant. But you need to cover all of the leaf. And uh, aircraft applications can put it on a lot lighter than what we do. We use about 20 gallons to the acre aircraft to somewhere down around five. But what they do is put it out in a real fine mist that covers the plant completely. By spraying, you may get one side of it. If you don't go around and get the other side, we'll make sure you get the total leaf covered. A lot of times you'll just get part of it and that's not as effective. Timing, John talked a little bit about timing. Um, can I run that up a little? Don Calkins, a lot of experience in the valley, says the time to spray is when you got the chemical in the tank. Uh, that may not be quite right, but it's part of the persi per persistence thing. Uh, but a lot of people go too early. Uh, the easiest plant to kill is the healthiest plant. So if you've got good soil moisture, you've got good temperatures, you've got good phenology in the plant, you're going to have a better chance to kill that plant weed than you will if it's dry, it's got its mouth closed, it's not taking in any kind of chemicals. We like to wait, and I think CSU agrees that to about six inches high for Canada thistle, have it in the bud stage, and then for the rest of the summer with good growing conditions, that's a good time to spray. Clear in the fall, a lot of people will say that's the best time, and it's a very good time. You need about 60% green on that plant to be effective in the fall. One of the problems that we run into is that those plants have had irrigation water all summer and then they chop off the water and so they start drying up and that plant's not going to absorb the chemicals if it's dry and hasn't got, had any water for several days. 
Probably the most important thing is competition at the bottom. Uh, competition, the grass is your friend, so is clover. Anything that will establish a, the, the plants and prevent infections from coming in. You can, as John showed you that picture with a lot of those candid thistle with the seeds about ready to blow all over. You can think of it like aspen or cotton seeds. You know, man, if, if a very small percentage of aspen and cottonwood uh, that flew around took hold, we'd be in a bamboo forest around here. And so if you've got your ground covered and, and got a good cover and not being disturbed, you've got your first line defense against any kind of infection. And then you want to work on the infection. Okay, precautions drift is the number one problem that we run into. And so if you spray and you've got some wind uh, or it's in a situation where next to a building, we've seen a lot and you'll see it with the smoke, it'll curl around the building and you'll actually get some damage to plants that you wouldn't think you ever would. But so watch, watch that inversions will hold things down just like smoke, and so your, your chemical mist will, will travel quite a distance. So if you're around desirable plants, make, make sure you understand what's gonna happen. Surfactant is, is something you add to it. A lot of people add a little Dawn soap, just a tiny bit. You can think of it like the hood on an automobile that has a lot of wax on it and the water all bubbles up. If you put a little bit of soap with that, that material will spread out over the leaves and you have a lot better chance of that leaf absorbing it. We use a commercial surfactant and I think their advertisers are probably ahead of their chemists, but it's supposed to open up the, the stomas and make the plant accept it better and a lot of other things. But use some kind of a surfactant uh, concentration, you know, don't overdo it. Uh, you're probably not going to get any better kill because you doubled or tripled the amount of chemical you put in the tank. You need to be able to, in most plants, let it translocate. And so if it burns itself right off the bat, you're not going to get it in the roots. The old wives' tale is a slow kill is a better kill. And so, you know, the bottom line is you want to kill. Okay, we'll look at a few examples. I'm gonna do turf first, and turf primarily, I, we think of it as like Jorgensen, which we do in the, in the parks up at Crested Butte, but any area that is grown just for grass would be considered a turf. Um, we get a lot of questions about it being safe for people to go in. I mean, they're logical, good questions. EPA says that any of their turf chemicals have to be safe even if they're wet because we can't control people going in. This is true in the parks and it would be true at your place if you was gonna spray and you didn't have some way to keep animals and people out of there. And so the ones that they will label for turf have to be safe even if they're wet we ask people to stay off until it's dry, and then it's just like a salt on the leaf. It, it flakes off, and, and so you give, get another safety factor. We talked about the chemicals, and uh, there are a lot of chemicals that are labeled for turf. We, most of them, the good ones, are a three-way chemical. One, one of the chemicals will kill through the roots, which is usually Dicamba is a, is a good one, and you'll get one that'll kill through the leaves and translocate, and MCPA is, is one of those. But the bottom line is look for a combination of chemicals. You, you'll get a better hit on your plants with that. Uh, the one that we use is called horsepower and cool power, depending on the temperature, and those, that same chemical is available to your folks over the counter. Small pastures, uh, it's obvious if the infection's very big, you're gonna have to have some kind of mechanical application. Am I running over? No, you got five minutes. Okay. We'll get you a microphone real quick. Some kind of mechanical 
application again you need to be able to put it out a long ways past where you think the infection is past where the infection is uh, and you also that way you can put down enough chemical to do some good you're not out there just shooting with a with a gun I, we see people go out with scissors and cutting them uh, and, and I won't mention the place but uh, and then next step up is they get a little Windex bottle and they'll go out with that and then finally at the end they'll do something that really makes a difference with some kind of larger mechanical application. ATVs anymore, we can get a tank for one of those and boomless sprayers and cover a lot of country. Small pastures tend to be overgrazed, you know, we, and, and so when you do that, you're opening up the soil, you're taking out your competition, and you're, you're ripe for infection. And, and the plants that are in there are going to have an advantage because the animals use it are going to not be concentrating on the weeds you want to get rid of. They're going to be concentrating on the plants that taste good to them. Chemicals, uh, probably the one that's the most popular is Milestone. I think the local conservation district sells it. The chemical in Milestone now is in several other formulations. The one we use now is called Open Site. It's a granular form formulation. We like it because it combines two chemicals and it's about the same price and we don't worry so much about spillage. And uh, so secondary containment and storage is, becomes less of a problem. We like open site. The downside to open site is, is that it, the label will tell you that the hay and the manure must stay on the place for 18 months and just use it yourself because that chemical can be passed through the hay or through the manure and then if it goes into compost or on somebody's place where they want to save the broadleaf, so they're at risk. We tell people, we hand them a written uh, brochure, a brochure that tells them of this, so if they sell the hay, the person that buys the hay has, has been informed of what they have to do with it. It's in, uh, the other one that is an old time one is Tordon. Tordon kills through the roots and I had one place that I could not get any kill on it, and I finally figured out that there was so much litter on the ground, there's so much duff, that that chemical was absorbed just like a sponge and never ever got to the roots. Tordon is a, is, has a good re residual effect, but it is deadly to any kind of nightshade plants, tomatoes, or or potatoes, it's banned in the San Luis Valley. They won't let it come down there, so it's a restricted use pesticide, not because of what it does to plants or humans, or I, plants other than the, the uh, nightshades. But it's, it's a good old standard. It's safe for us humans because we pass it through our urine quicker than we do some of the others that are stored in our fat. Okay, real quick on flower beds, and we get a lot of people that want us to do something about their Canada thistle in their flower beds. Uh, there's really not much we can do in that. What, what we recommend people try is that they take a foam brush and some Roundup and paint the leaves on the Canada thistle that they want to get rid of. If it's a young infection, they can dig them out, and again, that... Uh, over a period of time, you can deplete the root reserves and, and get some kind of control. But a lot of times, they just need to dig the flower bed up and start all over because it's, it's almost hopeless once they get infected. I'm happy to talk to anybody one-on-one -on -one at any time you have any kind of questions today or later. Let me know. I have a very bad hearing disability, and so group discussions are pretty much out for me. Thanks everybody for coming.